Second, Second Corinthians. How important is it that we have a Bible? I wouldn't be here without it. I wouldn't be here without the Bible. <clears throat> and uh, there is a, a spirit and us teaching about another spirit, another gospel, another Jesus. There is a spirit that is pervading and moving in. It, it moves in anywhere that or any place that the Bible is not revered, not regarded, uh, taken away. Um, who remembers a time before 1963 when the Supreme Court banned prayer in school? Who remembers that time? Okay, some of you do, okay? Um, the world has changed since then. Okay, I don't know if you've noticed or not. You've noticed it. Okay, I figured you would. Um, 1963, and prior to 1963, there was um, a survey done of public schools and some of the drastic problems that schools were dealing with uh, in the late 50s, early 60s. Okay, the serious, serious issues that schools were dealing with uh, the, the most difficult issues they were dealing with was, number one, gum chewing in class. Okay, very serious. Uh, number two, uh, students being late for school. Number three, students running in the hallway. Okay, the top three things that schools were very, very concerned about, and this is before 1963. I think it could be safely said that in 2017, gum chewing is not the biggest issue that schools deal with right now. Guns. Guns, illegal guns in schools. Okay? Um, teen pregnancy. Okay? Uh, students being killed in knife fights at school. Things like that. It's a little bit different world today than it was back then. But what happened was a spirit began to, I guess, sort of pervade, strengthen, take over because of a lack of serious Bible study, Bible reading amongst most Americans. Those days are now gone. We can see a different world. So, in the churches, we know, we know the effects of a lack of Bible and the spirit that represents that Bible, a lack of that spirit in this world today. We've seen the effects now. The lack of a Bible in churches also has taken its toll. And the reason why some of you are here, the reason why we even have so many people on the other side of that camera is that people go and they try to visit. I, I got, was contacted by a lady this week wanted me to pray for her a couple weeks ago because she was going to go try out a church in her area. And um, she went and tried it out and wrote me back and said, there's just a very, very bad spirit and you can see the fruit of that spirit in this church. And uh, what is happening is people are going to hear the Word of God, and they're not hearing the Word of God. They're not hearing it in a church. Um, I'm going to read this, and I'm going to switch back over, Michael, to the, my original PowerPoint that I had. Um, this is one of the, I guess, uh, prevailing ideas amongst ministers, amongst pastors in churches now, concerning the Bible. You see, there's a, there's a YouTube. In fact, you can look this up on YouTube. God is bigger than his Bible, okay? This is from the other Bethel church, okay, in Redding, California. I actually had a call from a lady, and she said, um, uh, she said, I'm going to be traveling uh, it, to America 
and I would like to come. This is Bethel Church, isn't it? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I would like to come and visit your church. I said, okay. She said, now, I'll be in California. And I said, okay. I said, um, when will you be flying into the St. Louis area? And she said, I'm not. And I said, well, we are about 30 miles south of St. Louis. Oh, she said, this is not Bethel Church in Redding, California? I said, no, ma'am, it's not. Yeah, so she said, oh, I have the wrong church. Goodbye, click. Before I had a chance to, you know, try to sell her on this one, okay? This is, this is what, if you watch this video, this is what this guy said. Uh, this is from Chris Vallotton, Bethel Church, Redding, California. He said, the word of God without the spirit of God is not true. And what he's, here's what he's establishing. He, his, his main premise is God is bigger than his Bible. Who in here agrees with that? I don't. He's as big as the Bible says he is. Okay? But they're trying to separate God and the movements of the Holy Spirit away from the Bible. He said, it's important to have a relationship with the Spirit and not just a relationship with the Bible. Well, let me tell you something. You can't have one without the other. Okay, that doesn't work. Somebody uh, once said, all the answers to life are in the Bible. And he said, that's not true. And then he said, not all of God is in the Bible. Not all of God is in the Bible. Now, turn to Genesis 3. I'm going to show you that that, I'm going to show you what spirit that is. Not all of God is in the Bible. Genesis 3. I'll show you that spirit. That spirit, let's see here, let me go back to, uh, in, uh, Verse 1, the serpent said, Yea, hath God said, uh, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, even though, even though that's exactly what God said. The devil then is contradicting God's word. And he says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, that represents the spirit that says God has a teaching, or God has a secret, or God has something that he is withholding from man. He's not publishing it in the Bible. And Satan, then, is the one who's going to reveal that secret teaching or that secret doctrine. So the spirit that says not all of God is in the Bible, that's that spirit. It's the spirit, it's the vine of Sodom that uh, Moses spoke about. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. The devil in um, Genesis 3 is in his true form. He's a serpent. And um, in Deuteronomy 32, verse uh, 31, For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom, the fields of Gomorrah. Our vine is the true vine, Jesus Christ. But their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Verse 33, here it is. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps, serpents. And so the, the spirit that says not all of God is in the Bible or there are teachings from God that's not coming to us by way of the Bible. Uh, the Bible doesn't say everything that God is or God does or... There is a new doctrine now that God is giving to his servants or his prophets or his people. Uh, but in some way, shape, or form, it excludes the Bible. It is a teaching about God and about something that he has for us, but it is, a, it is not found in the scriptures anywhere 
now you recognize that that is another spirit. That is not the same spirit as what you'll find recorded for you in the Bible. Um, turn to, let me establish something here. Turn to John chapter 6. This is touching a little bit on what we did last Sunday, but I'm, I'm moving on. Let's see here. Revelation, there we go. John chapter 6. Verse 63, he said, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. How many of y'all know that? Say amen. You come dragging that wicked, low-down, hell-deserving flesh body of yours that's been out in the world all week. You come dragging that in here not to elevate it, but to crucify it. Put your flesh, leave it on the altar. The altar's the cross. Leave your flesh there and worship God in spirit and in truth. He said, thy word is truth. Worshiping God does not always mean having a big music service. Okay? Worshiping God has a lot to do with serving God. You'll find that in the Bible. They worshiped and served. Look for those two words together. You'll see it. So he said, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, last week we were, we were talking about this. We were talking about the seven spirits of God. There in Isaiah 11, you can turn in your Bibles, you can look up there on the screen, this is kind of where we left it last week. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, that's the first one, the Spirit of wisdom, that's the second, the Spirit of understanding, that's the third one, the Spirit of counsel, that's fourth, the Spirit of might, that's five, the Spirit of knowledge, that's six. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord. There's your seven spirits of God right there. In other words, if you're testing spirits, which is what we're told to do, because we've been informed, that's why I've been dealing with this, 2 Corinthians 11, we've been informed now that God's men preach the true spirit of God, and there are other men or women who preach another spirit or a different spirit. So how is it that anybody can be smart enough to discern which is the real Spirit of God and which is the imposter, the one that's not the Spirit of God. How can we know? Well, number one, we can know by the manifestation of that Spirit. Is it manifesting the Spirit of the Lord? Is it manifesting true biblical wisdom? Is it manifesting true biblical understanding? Is it sticking with the words of the Bible? The spirit of counsel, the spirit of night, the spirit of knowledge. Is that spirit abiding in your knowledge of the word of God or the general knowledge of the word of God? If it says something that is contradictory to the word of God, then that spirit is not the true spirit of God. It's a false spirit. It's another spirit. It's a lying spirit. It is a devil is what it is. And the fear of the Lord. Uh, if you are not afraid of what God can do to you, and they try to bring in a spirit that says you're not supposed to have any fear, if, they, if that spirit comes in and, you're, and you say, well, I don't, fear what, I don't fear God, then that's not the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's not the Holy Spirit. So there's the manifestation of the Spirit. Now let me tell you, let me just kind of go off track here. Gibberish unintelligible tongues is not the sign of the Spirit of God. Look, look on here, look in your list here. Is there anything among the seven spirits of God that refer to or you can see unintelligible tongues where someone speaks and no one knows what was being said. Can you see that anywhere in those seven spirits? There is no spirit of misunderstanding. There is no spirit of misinterpretation. There is no spirit of chaos. There is no spirit of, um, 
Give me some other words I can use here to describe it. Other than the ones Wayne gave us last Sunday. Man, I'd like to get you, I'd like to get you recorded. Use Wayne speaking in tongues. Okay? He can make it up better than anybody. Okay? There is a deal, there is a video, you can put, you can find it online, of Kenneth Copeland and Rodney Howard Brown in uh, up on the stage in front of probably thousands of people talking to each other in unintelligible tongues. They spoke to each other and no interpretation was given of anything of what they said. That is a violation of 1 Corinthians 14. Yeah, and, and there was that laughter deal going on and drunkenness. Walking around like they were drunk men. That is not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God brings sobriety, not drunkenness. Paul said, uh, do not be filled with, do not uh, drink wine where it is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. He did not equate the two in that verse. He contrasted them. Do not be drunk with wine where it is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit, it is the opposite of being drunk with the wine from the vine of Sodom. You're not carrying with you the poison of serpents. Now, I like this, because we know that Jesus is, um, is the stem of Jesse. He's, he comes forth out of David. And we know that he had those seven spirits with him whithersoever he went. And then he declared to us in John 6 that his words were that spirit. The words that Jesus speaks are that spirit of God. So... Turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. I love this. Man, I love this. Right here, we're going to see a connection between Christ, the seven spirits, and a certain book that you bring to Sunday school, or you should have brought to Sunday school. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. Written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Seven seals, seven spirits. Is it a coincidence? I don't think so. We are sealed in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul said that we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right? So the book is sealed. We are sealed because we're people of the... Even the Muslims. You know what the Muslim phrase for us Christians is? People of the book. They, that to, uh, to them, that's a derogatory term toward us. I wear it with honor. Amen? People of the book. Amen. So anyway, and then there's that uh, verse to us, saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor in the, under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. That is what you see right there in Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. He connected it right there. The root of David, weep not, for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So in verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne... And of the four beasts, I like this, get ready for this. In the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. I love that. By the way, when John sees him earlier in Revelation chapter 1, do you know what he looks like? He looks like a lamb. Because on his head, his hair was like wool, white as snow. He had... Lamb's wool, white as snow on his head. He was, he's like a lamb, amen? As it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Now, it looks a little strange, doesn't it? Seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So here's Christ, and when John sees him, he sees the seven horns that are on his head. What do horns represent in the Bible? Does anybody know? Horns. What do you think they represent? Huh? 
Kingdoms? Possibly. What do horns represent on a bull? When you see horns coming at you, get out of the way, because they're not going to be stopped. When two rams are up on top of the mountainside and they're fighting for territory, do they shoot each other? Do they arm wrestle? What do they do? Wham! And the horns of a ram is what drives all the other rams out of the way. Okay? Even when the lions go after these uh, water buffaloes in, in Africa, you got a lion, you got about four lions attacking this little water buffalo, and the big water buffalo, the head of the tribe, he's got two horns, he'll go over to those lions and he'll literally rip those lions off of his, his uh, herd mate or whatever, the, whatever he calls them, rips those lions off of that, of that poor water buffalo with his horns, and he runs after them, and he, he's saying to them, you get back! He's in, he's in my herd, you're not touching him. Okay? So when you see horns in the Bible, uh, it represents force, and it represents, I'm in charge, always. Okay? Now let me ask you a question. With that image in mind, do you remember the day when the Holy Ghost really got a hold of you and shook you? Could you have resisted? What no way you were going to resist. Because the Spirit of God and the horns of Christ, basically, there was no way to resist the Spirit of God working in you. And you submitted, you knelt, you bowed, you prayed. You submitted to the will of God because one of those horns is the fear of the Lord. In fact, the seventh horn is the fear of the Lord. Amen? Who remembers that day? Who remembers a day when you were scared to death of what God was going to do to you? Woo! That's what those horns represent. Everybody got that picture? Okay? So now, now we have a connection. In Revelation 5, you have a connection. You have the book, which is what you have right here. You have the seven spirits of God, and you have the Lamb who is also the Word of God. Meaning that the Word of God carries with it the force of the seven spirits of God. This book has power in it, doesn't it? So let's say that Let's say, Mike, that uh, everything's going real great for a while, and boy, I mean, life is just peachy keen, and all of a sudden, devils are just all over you. You ever had those days? Eating you up. And so you cried to the Lord. You begged God, God, I can't, I can't do this. I can't fight them off. So the lamb comes down with seven horns, and what does he do? Throws them off. Like that water buffalo with his horns, picking those. I, I was watching, the reason why I said that, I was watching a video before church this morning of, of a water buffalo doing exactly that. He reached down with his horn and picked up a lion with his horn. And you could see that horn sticking in the side of that lion. It wounded that lion to death. That, that lion died. But he literally picked that lion up off with his horn and slung him. And that lion went going. Okay? When the word of God is present in your life, or let's say in a church, devils don't like it. They're afraid of the power that's in this book. And they should be. So... If the devil succeeds in removing the seven horns, the seven spirits, out of a church, out of a nation, out of a family, out of your life, he has nothing then to be afraid of, and they'll just pile on. Now, some people want that, because these devils are giving them sensuous pleasures from the world. And the more pleasures, the better off they like it. Okay? But at some point, it's not going to turn out well for them. But you have power against these spirits. 
The Bible even says uh, they marveled at Jesus and they said, What word is this that with his words he casteth out devils? He does it with his word. So you got devils eating you up, chewing you up, getting at you. You get this Bible out and you start reading. Maybe God will lead you someplace. Maybe, maybe just go to the Psalms and just start reading. Reading out loud, however you want to do it. Okay? But the Holy Ghost of God shows up with those seven horns and those devils do not stand a chance. They do not have power over this book. Amen? Now, turn to Judges. Judges 16. We're going to learn a story about this. There's a picture of it. This hit me one day and I went, God, that is so beautiful. Samson. Who could beat Samson? Who defeated Samson? Who could, who could defeat him? Okay? Somebody named, if you, if you know from memory, somebody named... One of the exploits of Samson, what is it that he did that gave him the reputation that he had? He found a lion, and what did he do with it? He, with his bare hands, he ripped it apart. Whew. Lions are lions are all meat. They are all meat. They're very muscular animals, very strong animals. And Goliath, just with his hands, just ripped that thing apart. What else did he do? Anybody? Anybody know? Huh? Yeah? Um, Philistines. Jawbone of an ass. What did he do? How many Philistines did he slay with the jawbone of an ass? Huh? A thousand? Okay. Imagine a man who is able to beat a thousand men with just a jawbone from a donkey. That's what he did. Okay? That's, that's like superhero comic book type stuff. But this, if you don't believe that now, you're going to have a tough time in life. Because God gave Goli or Samson that power by way of what? What was the symbol of his strength and his power? His hair. And how was his hair... Divide it up. Let's read it. Judges 16, verse 16. Because the Philistines, they paid Delilah. They paid her a very large sum of money. 1,100 pieces of silver. And there were five lords of the Philistines, and they all promised her 1,100 pieces of silver apiece. That's 5,500 pieces of silver. She was going to get rich off this deal if she could get uh, Samson to tell the deal of how, of how he had this strength. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. Verse 19, now watch this. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off what? Seven locks of his head. You know what those are? The seven horns. He's got his hair braided in seven locks. Now this... Samson was not known for his good, stylish looks. Okay? But he took his hair and he wove it together in seven different locks. The seven locks on Samson's head are the seven spirits of God. They represent the seven horns that are on the lamp. This is why he had that power. Now watch this. You, as a born-again Bible believer, have that power same power only we don't fight against flesh and blood do we we go after principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places that's who we're warring against so in case you just decide one day to find an old jawbone from a donkey or mule or something like that and try to go kill a thousand men I'll come visit you in prison okay 
Uh, anyway, but you as a believer in Christ and a believer in the Bible have that power in you. You have the seven locks. The Nazarite vow was a, that was a vow of separation. God calls us out from this world to be separate from this world. Now I won't get into the Nazarite vow deal, but Samson had that power. You have that power unless you find yourself asleep one day on Delilah's knees. You know who Delilah is in this story. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, because that's who she is. An abomination to the earth. And for money, she sells out the man of God and removes his power. So here comes the old Philistines with their scissors. And they cut off those seven locks, which represent the seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God. She cut off his power. Now I'm going to tell you something. And there is a, there is a great, I'd never be able to preach it as well as he did. But Brother Reg Kelly preached probably one of the best messages I ever heard on this, about the second sermon I heard him preach on. And it was about haircuts from hell. And he, dis, he defined and described how, how Delilah or how Babylon will come and shear off our power in life. And, and it basically is... When you let the devil talk you out of your Bible time, Bible reading, Bible memorization, Bible meditation, Bible proclamation. There's all kinds of, it's, it's three more, I can't remember what they are, but they all center on the Word of God. And at one time, I caught Delilah cutting off God's power in my life from me. I had no power to stand against my enemies. None. But just like Samson, there at the end, what happened with him? Hair started growing back, okay? And I recognize that I have no power outside of this book. You have no power outside of this book. You want power to defeat your enemies, the power to defeat your own sins, power to stand against your enemies, power in prayer, power in witnessing to people, power in living the life that God has called us to live. You want that power in your life, then you better get, you, you better get your Bible out and start doing some spiritual exercises. Amen? You think about what happened, what, how she sold him out, and how she has sold out church after church after church. So here's a man. So let's say, let's say that guy that we had up on the screen from the other Bethel church was standing here, and I'm standing here. Now I'm telling you that everything that God is, is in your Bible. I'm telling you that everything, this, every time the Spirit moves, He moves in the context of the Word of God. I'm telling you that everything that God does in your life is to be found and is sourced from the very Word of God that we preach here. And then we have this guy over here who's telling you, no, 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 not everything God does is in the Bible. You don't have to, sometimes you just don't have to worry about the Bible. The Bible's not really true all the time. And, and uh, sometimes the Spirit will do things that are not in the Bible. Now I want you to think about that. What spirit is telling these people to close their Bible? It's Delilah. Mystery Babylon. Succeeding in cutting off the seven locks of a church's hair so they have no power to stand against the enemy. So it's no wonder that these drunk spirits come in then they start ex accepting all kinds of ill things. They start accepting sodomy and everything else that's going on because they have no power to stand against it. Father in heaven, your word is right. It is truth. It does not need me to make it true. It is always true. We thank you for this, giving us the spirit of God through the word of God. Father, I've known 
the times when you spoke to my heart because you did so through the pages of your word. I know also, Lord God, that I've asked you to show me whether men were lying to me by showing me whether what they said was in the Bible or not. And without fail, all men are liars. And only God and his word are true. Father, you've magnified your word even above your name. Father, help us to read more. Help us to study more. Help us to memorize more. Help us to think more on these things. Help us, dear God, to proclaim more of the word of God in our lives. Give us power and might against our enemies. Father, don't let the devil have us. Don't let him have our families. Don't let him have our children. Don't let him have our homes and our church. Father, help us all to stand strong with those seven spirits. We thank you, God, for the word of God. Teach us, teach us, Lord, afresh some things, God, that we've forgotten. Teach us new things, Lord, we've never seen before in the Bible, but teach them to us from your word. We ask your blessings on it. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.